Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining me again. It is Wednesday and today we've, uh, we're have we going to be doing a rose. So uh, I want to say hello to everybody who is joining. If it's your first time, welcome. And I am Shelley. I am a watercolor artist in Ontario, Canada. Now, many of you actually came out to uh, say hello to me at uh, the Art in the Park on the weekend, and I want to thank you very much for that because I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you and uh, and putting a face to some of these names. Uh, some of the people are from all over the place, and I know some of you are too far away to come to uh, see me at a, at a local show, but uh, for those of you that were able to come, I really thank you so much for that, and uh, we'll just get right into this. Um, let's move on over to my demonstration here. Okay, so this is the reference picture that I have uh, taken. If you are looking for this reference picture, I have posted it in my on my Facebook page. So uh, you can uh, head on over there after and uh, download that if you want to. So uh, this is my own reference picture. So you're you're welcome to use that and. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to just jump right in. So when I'm looking at this, I do not actually see any pure white paper. So I'm going to get rid of the white of the paper. That's one of the first things I'm going to do. If there had been white on here, I would work around those whites or I would simply avoid painting those areas. And one thing I don't think I have talked about too much in past demonstrations is that um, the first layer that we put on, um, and, and this is something that I used to do myself, the first layer that I put on, I used to think that it was so important to stay inside the lines. But honestly, the first layer is simply tinting the paper. Now, this is one of many ways to paint. Sometimes I do this, depends on what I'm doing. If I'm doing something like crystal, I'm not going to let paint you know, bleed out in different directions. Depends on the style of painting that you're doing. So I'm just going to begin with some clean water and I'm going to wet my paper. My brush had a little bit of blue in it, but that's okay. It won't matter in the end. Could have done a better job of cleaning it, I guess. <laughs> but we're just going to wet this paper. I'm going to let some of that absorb in. And of course, as you know, What's going to happen is as it absorbs in, it's going to start to wrinkle the paper. That's completely normal. Uh, I used to get so worried about all that, but it really doesn't matter because I know that if I've stretched it with these staples, that I will be able to, uh, it'll, it'll dry flat again. So if you wet your paper, staple it down, it will dry flat. And as you can see, it's getting pretty wrinkled already. And it's, it's good and wet. So I'm going to let some of this absorb into the paper. And I want to make sure I haven't missed any places. I was using that brush for something else and I could have cleaned it out a little better, but it's, it's going to be so light. It looks like it's showing now, the, that little bit of blue, but it won't show in the end. So I'm spreading this water around because as it makes little ripples and things like that, uh, you'll notice that it will, um, uh, you know, collect in the valleys and the peaks will end up being quite dry. So I'm going to switch over here to another angle so that you can really see that, uh, that accumulation and how the paper is wrinkling. So I'm just going to tip my board and drink up so you can see all of this that's gathering at the edge and I'm just going to drink that up. That's where the excess is all gathering in those valleys. I can tip it this way and, and let it collect at the bottom and just absorb that as well. All right, so by tipping it, I can use gravity to move the paint around, or the water around and I can use my brush. I can also use a, a brush to blot up some of that excess as well, but Mostly I'm just absorbing it with a paper towel. Okay, so now I'm getting 
I'm getting kind of a very uniform sheen on the paper, as you can see. And yes, it's very wrinkled. If I were to paint into this immediately, what's going to happen is that the same thing. It's going to just settle into the valleys. So I'm waiting for that shine on the paper to just uh, absorb a little bit and go from this glossy. You can see it's quite glossy looking right now. And I'm going to look for uh, something a little bit more satin finish. You know when you buy paint for your home and it's got a, uh, it's either got a uh, flat finish or it's got a satin finish or a glossy. So right now we're at the glossy stage and I'm going to wait for it to get to the um, satin stage. Meanwhile, I'm going to tell you what uh, materials I'm using. This is Arches 140 pound cold press paper or Arsh if, uh, if you pronounce it that way. Um, I'm going to be using a variety of um, squirrel hair brushes. These ones are actually travel brushes by Baya Elk. And if you want to know any of the uh, materials that I typically use in my painting, you can go to my website. I have a page that's called Materials, and I have a listing of all my colors that I use, my palette. And if you scroll down, there's a number of different sources as well. So uh, the palette I'm using, it's a speedball color wheel palette and you can see that I've added quite a bit of water to each of my paints. You can see the shine on there. Um, they're almost a little bit puddled right now so I'm trying to get my paints softened up. Softening up your paints of course does make them a lot creamier when you go to paint with them and gives you richer color. So I did take a little um, pipette like this and I uh, added some water to each of my wells in order to um, to get those soft. And that's been sitting there for about, oh, maybe 10 minutes or so. So my paint will be starting to get nice and soft. The uh, It takes a little while for that water to absorb in. Uh, most of my paints are Da Vinci, but uh, I do also have some Winsor Newton. I have some uh, Daniel Smith, I have some Core. I have lots of uh, different brands in here, but uh, most of them I would say are Da Vinci. Uh, that, uh, as I said, my palette is listed on my materials page of my website right there. So, um, if you have a question, I'm going to ask, if you put it in capitals, it'll be a lot easier for me to spot. Sometimes the chat kind of goes by quickly, and uh, I don't want to miss your question, so... Um, uh, I I do see one question. So, uh, Wen is asking, uh, so you stretch your paper so the papers go back to flat when dry, but while painting it still wrinkles. That's that is correct. Um, now I will tell you that I didn't I didn't really stretch this too much. I only wet the back of this paper, which is I only did because of time. I, I was running out of time. <laughs> that's that's the truth here, but um, I was running out of time. But normally I would soak the whole paper and um, staple that down. But I'm hoping that wetting just the back is going to help a lot. So the back has been wet and it has shrunk. The front is now wet and it is also shrinking. So you can see that the shine is beginning to get a little more satiny. It's not as glossy. You can tell, right? So now when it's at that stage, that's kind of, for me, that's kind of like the magic stage. This is when I can start coming in and um, painting and actually being able to allow some of the paint to stay where I'm placing it. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take a, let's see, a number, a number 10 brush. And keep in mind that brush numbers, like brush sizes, can change from one manufacturer to another and one, from one country to another. So generally, I, I will say, you know, compared to my baby finger, that's how large a brush I'm using. And uh, the rose itself is got a, a blushy kind of pink color. But what I'm going to be looking, <coughs> excuse me, looking for right away is the lightest color. So this fold over part of the petal is a lot lighter than this one. So I don't want to put it this color everywhere. I want to put the light color everywhere. Uh, the perimeters, are, it's also almost like a vignette that I created here. I kind of, um, I kind of uh, darkened uh, 
the roses in the background to in, or, in order to push them back, make them a little bit more gray, because I didn't want them to compete with this one. I really wanted this one to be the focal point. So I'm going to um, I'm going to get a color mixed up here, and I'm going to use permanent rose. Now that's obviously much, much, much too bright. So I'm going to add to that um, some raw sienna. And you'll see it'll get a little bit softer. If I add too much uh, raw sienna, it will no longer be pink. It'll really start to become a peach uh, color. But I do know that I want it um, somewhat diluted because I want to keep the color light. But I want you to keep one thing in mind. As I paint this and I put the color on here, it's going to dry an awful lot lighter. Uh, watercolor will typically dry about 25% lighter than what it looks like when it's wet. So as you put the color down, it will look like it's too dark, but keep in mind the paper is wet and it's further going to uh, dilute that color. <clears throat> so as it dilutes the color, uh, and it dries, it's going to get a lot lighter. It will also feel a lot darker because the background we're looking at currently is, is white of the paper. Now I can add, I can add more in areas that I know are going to be a little darker, like that center area. At the same time, I can blot my brush and maybe lift a little color out in areas that I want to keep a little lighter. So I can start to, I'm like a sculptor and I can start to carve out this design. So I know that certain areas are going to be lighter. I can use my brush, my blotted brush, and pull up some of that color. And I know that that will keep those areas light. But um, before I get into all of that, I'm just going to put a little more color on here first of all and then I'm going to start thinking about colors for the background as well. So there's a little bit more of my rose color which I know I'm going to need. And um, for my background uh, I think I'd like to incorporate maybe, um, because I want to make it a little bit duller, I'm going to put a little bit of blue in there. Not too much, just a little bit of blue. And tone down this, this background area. Now, I want you to notice how uh, quickly I'm applying this. Uh, the one thing I do need to do is work quickly before that, that satin shine starts to become flat. I need, to, I need to do that. And I also need to consider that if the paper's drying, my brush will also need to be less wet as well because if I put down a really wet brush on my on my paper then suddenly what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to create blossoms because the wetter brush is going to push away that color. So I'm going to sort of put some of this color in the background too but you can see as it mixes with some of the blue it gets a little bit duller. So I can hint at some of these roses in the background, but they will be less bright because of that little, little bit of blue that's in there. So I can just hint at those. Um, and you can see I'm not really thinking about staying inside of lines or anything like that. I'm not, uh, not concerned with that right now. I'm going to put in a little bit of... Um, a little bit of green as well. So I need to mix up a green. Let's take some of my cobalt blue. And I'll take a little bit of, and I don't want to make it to really bright green, so I'm going to go with, um, uh, I'll, go, I'll go with some quinacridone gold. That will give me a green that won't be so bright. The, the rose itself, you can tell that the rose is um, shading some of the the greenery down here so I really don't want a lot of um, bright greens down in here so if I take something like Queen Gold which is a little bit more orange and I mix that with my blue now you know that um, 
orange and blue are complementary colors, so what's going to happen is that is going to dull down my colors, uh, take less uh, emphasis away from, um, from this area. So, put some of that in there, rinse out my brush. I'm going to put a little bit more um, rose color down in here. There we go. So all I've done here, I haven't really painted anything. I haven't worried about staying in lines or anything like that. This is the point, you can see the shine. Let me wipe off my tape first of all so it doesn't create any problems. But you can see that um, I haven't really worried about staying inside the lines yet. I mean, I, they, the lines are there as a guideline at the first stage. Uh, the lines are really more there for the details than anything else and um, the the adding in of other values. But you can see I've still got some good shine there. So what I can do is if I want to lift out and make some of these a little bit lighter, this is my chance. Blotted brush, let's make sure it's clean. And I can bring my brush along here and pull out and lighten some of these petals and I can I can get an awful lot of work done in this first stage of my uh, washes and if you worry less about staying inside of the lines and worry more about just sort of general placement of color and getting rid of the white paper I think you'll find that you'll um, you'll have a much softer effect but you'll also um, get get a little bit more uh, continuity in your painting you know some of the colors will sort of bleed outside the lines and things like that and that actually hap happens to make uh, what, what they would call a visual connection right so you you see that the colors are sort of um, um, cross-pollinating with other colors in the pa painting so you get a lot of uh, different things I think I'm, I'm gonna put a little bit of my green up in here while I still can. So I'm going to put a little green up in here. Just notice that there's kind of an area up there that could be green. And if my brush isn't too wet, I know that I can paint with a reasonable amount of control. If I come in with a really wet brush at this point, well then, you know, it's, it's anybody's guess where that paint's going to travel. So by working in um, with a wetter or a drier brush on a wet surface, I have a little bit of control. Not total control because of course things are wet and watercolor being watercolor it will flow. But I can I can generalize and get you know basically the white of the paper is gone. The material of the board on which I've stapled my wet paper, this is called gator board. It is a very lightweight very popular um, surface that a lot of people use it uh, and people like it because it is so lightweight and makes it great if you're plein air painting or if you are um, you know just taking it to classes or or whatever the case may be and it is um, it's actually got a veneer surface you can hear that is not foam board it may look like foam board from the side. You can see this, this side here. Let me go to my other camera. Um, this, this board, you can see that it, it looks like foam in the middle, but this is a very hard veneer and it's on the front and back, so you can use both sides. Um, it's sometimes called watercolor board. So if you're going to the art store, you may have to ask for gator board, and if they say they don't have it, ask for watercolor board. Uh, most um, most art stores w would or would typically carry it, but I do have a couple of sources on my um, on my website, as I said, on my materials page, so you can always check that out. Um, I get mine in bulk from uh, Uline. They come in, <laughs> they actually come in massive sheets there because they are like it's like buying a piece of drywall. It's like uh, four feet by eight feet, and then I have to cut it down. But um, but economically for me and for the amount that I use myself, um, 
that works. So I'm just continuing to lift out some colors here uh, where some of these petals sort of roll over and I know that they're going to be a little bit lighter and I'm lifting it out and I'm lifting it with a damp brush because I know that the damp brush won't give me hard lines. If I come in with a really dry brush, I end up drying the, the surface of the paper and that will create harder lines. So I'm using a damp brush. All right, so lifting out some of these areas that are gonna be important. And if I'm working with a drier uh, paint at this stage, I can begin to come in and actually add to this. I can add some of my darks at this stage. So again, I have to make sure that my brush is a lot drier than my paper. If I want to maintain some control and not create any um, blossoms. So you can see I can come in, make sure my brush is blotted. I usually will test it, <laughs> just touch the paper lightly just to see how far it's going to travel. But I'll blot my brush And I can get a, a reasonable amount of control, even on a wet surface here. So let me get a little more color mixed up. I really do think I need some more. And this can be a little bit darker, because I am actually adding in some darker tones here now. And I'll blot my brush. And eventually this towel gets really wet, and I have to switch it out for a dry one but um, I want to blot my brush and start carving out where the shadows are, just the way a sculptor would work. Uh, you, you start pulling out, like identifying where the highlights are, carving out the shadows or the crevices if it were a sculptor, sculpture, and I can come in and create, start to create these. Now if they don't stay exactly within the lines, I'm still not worried at this stage. Um, I'm only adding this in at this point because I know that the paper is still um, workable. It, I've still got, I've still got some shine on it. It's, but you can see it's getting less and less all the time. And I know that the window in which I can work is not finite. I, I can or it is finite. I can only work for a certain amount of time and then my paper dictates to me when I have to stop whether I like it or not. So I need to uh, I need to listen to my paper and when it tells me that I can't paint anymore by creating blossoms or uh, by not uh, flowing the way I want it to, that's my signal. And um, it, it it turns into something that um, becomes a little bit more intuitive when you um, when you work. Uh, the way that I cut my gator board is um, with let me see, just with one of these retractable knives and a uh, yardstick, but you do have to hold it very firmly and do many cuts just to cut through one layer of this veneer. And then I flip it over and I cut from the other side. The foam part in the middle, that cuts like nothing. That's, that's like easy to cut. Uh, but the, the veneer on the outside, on both sides, uh, that is much tougher to cut through. That's how I'm cutting it. I know some people will actually take it and use it like a table saw or something like that. But uh, that has a tendency to chip the edges a little bit. So I have better success with uh, actually um, just cutting it by hand, even though it's harder. <laughs> but um, all right, so I'm, I'm going to put the last few little bits in here and Obviously, there is more that I need to do, but I don't want um, I don't want to reach a point where I don't have any control or the I start to get hard edges that I don't want. Uh, but this helps me to start to see the values, like you know how they can start building up, like and how I can start um, 
creating a little bit of form here. Now some of these, let me, let me point this out. I'm going to start thinking now in terms of color temperature. And I, I've mentioned this in past videos as well. But in this case, we've got some really nice light hitting this rose. We've got uh, very, uh, very warm highlights here. Uh, you know, these are almost, almost detect a little bit of, <clears throat> pardon me, a little bit of um, a, a golden pink, shall we say, in some of this. And then we start coming over here to the darker shadows. And I can almost detect a little bit of blue. And a lot of people will ask me, how do I figure out what kind of lighting there is and, and what temperature the shadow should be? And it is the sort of thing that you, you will train your eye with experience, but um, basically anything that's warm is going to have a yellow or a um, maybe a peachy kind of color in the highlight. And then you, you'll see that, no, there's none of that in the shadow. So that, that's definitely got a hint of blue in it. And it's not really obvious. It's not the sort of thing that jumps out and says, oh, this is definitely cool, and oh, this is definitely warm. Uh, but if you start looking, you'll find it. And I, I have a tendency to almost exaggerate that a little bit. I, I mean, let's not go crazy and make bright yellow sh highlights and everything. I am a realist painter, so I, I don't want to go like so far beyond reality that it doesn't look good. But... Um, but definitely I have, um, this is more bluish, like it's got a, a, a kind of a purple pink uh, kind of tone to it. Uh, whereas this is, this is definitely a little bit more warm, a little bit more slightly steering towards a, a, a more golden tone. So it's the sort of thing you have to hunt for. All right, so I'm at the stage now, I don't see any shine left on my paper. Um, I, I was talking there for a bit. I probably could have put a little bit more in. Um, I was going to start switching into some uh, cool shadows here, but since there's no shine, I'm not going to risk it. And again, this is one of those things that you're really just going to have to um, <laughs> trial by fire, so shall we say, where you have to try it out and you'll find out soon enough what does not work timing wise. Uh, but for me, the, the um, deciding factor of when to stop is usually when I start to develop harder lines where I don't want them or if I, am, uh, if I see the shine. And I'm always looking at that shine. But I'm also, in addition to the paper, I'm thinking about the dampness of my brush. And this is the part that a lot of people forget because... You know, you're so worried about looking at the shine and everything, you forget about the brush and you go over here and you just, you say, oh, I need a little more of that pink. So you add some water to it. You know, it may have been drying up a little bit. You add some water to it. You forget to blot and you come over and you start painting and all of a sudden you've got a huge blossom. This is not at a stage yet where it is dry enough to add that kind of moisture. So what I'm going to do so I'm just going to take my dryer here and I'm going to dry this fully because that kind of sets the color. It'll move too easily right now, but if I dry it, I'll be able to um, re-wet the paper. I know that sounds funny to dry it before you need to wet it, but it does need to be fully dry to set those colors so they don't um, change up on me. Now it's still and it still kind of looks like, oh, I don't know, the background's kind of the same value as the flower. But don't forget, we'll be darkening a lot of stuff in the background. So this first stage, this is basically my tinting the paper stage. Uh, we think so often that, you know, we have to stay inside the lines. I guess we get taught that as children, right? <laughs> to stay inside the lines. And we get really kind of obsessed with it as adults. And, hey, I'm guilty as charged. I used to worry about that an awful lot myself, which is kind of silly now that I look back on it. But this stage really doesn't need to be that precise. We, you know, so 
If you haven't worked this way before, take a piece of paper, call it a complete experiment, uh, something you can toss in the garbage and not be broken hearted about. Um, I think when you take something and you're painting it for the first time and you, you're thinking to yourself, oh, I hope this turns out, I want to give it to my friend for her birthday or something like that, and all of a sudden it becomes really precious. So I would highly recommend taking maybe the back of an old painting to try out new techniques and just see see what um, working outside your comfort zone can bring you because if we're always working inside our comfort zone we're probably not learning anything new. Now this is very warm. I have to allow this to cool back down to uh, room temperature. It's it's a little it's only a little bit damp, but it's it's dry enough that I'll be able to to dampen this and go back in. And um, at this stage, I can start um, carving out and maybe working one petal at a time if I wanted to, or I could come in and and dampen the whole thing, wait for that satin shine again, or that uh, that in between the the flat and should glossy stage. And, um, and I could start putting in a little bit more, but I could work one petal at a time as well. I often will, at this stage though, I will come in and I'll put something good and dark into my painting. I don't want to jump into detail or anything like that. And it, Typically speaking, yes, I work light to dark, but the reason that I like to put something dark in my painting at this stage is so that I have, um, I can visualize my full value range. I have my lightest colors in there already, and if I have the darkest color in there somewhere, then the one thing that I know I can do is I can gauge all my other values so much more easily. So my goal of putting something dark into the painting now is that I will be able to um, judge my, all my other values. Um, just reading through some of the comments. Um, oh, yes. Uh, that uh, That's true, Mary. Uh, if you come in with your brush too wet on a paper that is uh, only damp, you will get blossoms. It will it will move that first layer too easily. All right, so this is this is cooler. I can feel a little bit of dampness through there, but I don't think that that's going to be problematic. All right, so uh, I could come in with uh, I'm going to come in on one petal at a time. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I've decided I'm going to do. And one of the petals that I'm going to work on here is uh, this one because this one right here has a really dark area. So if I get that one little dark area in there, it'll give me that, that gauge once, you know, like this, this little dark here is almost as dark as this um, corner up here or down here at the bottom. So if I get that one little, one little petal in there, then I'm off to the races. I, I, I know my darks, I know my lights, and I can figure out everything else from there. Um, so much of watercolor is comparison. So um, compare um, how light this is based on how dark that is. And I will gauge all my values that way because, you know, values are more the most important thing here. I could be painting this in black and white. And uh, the, it would still look nice in black and white provided all my values are correct. So... I'm going to once again come in with my um, clean brush. Now this time I've gone something a little bit smaller because I'm working in a smaller area. And I'm going to dampen, I know it might seem unusual, but I'm going to dampen the entire uh, petal right here. Even the light area, which I don't intend to paint again. But I'm, I'm dampening the whole thing because you can't, you know, in order to get something that looks seamless, you cannot paint a patch. 
Um, it's, it's not that you can't. You have to be skilled, I guess, to paint a patch and uh, be able to soften it to look convincing. So I'm just going to paint carefully around my, um, my petal here. And I think I'll zoom in for this. Um, let me zoom in for it. Now you won't see the reference, but you can see the one right here. So I can, um, I'm just dampening this one petal right here. And there's part of it that comes right down into that spot. And I have to work carefully around my other lines. Now, it, because this is a nice soft rose, I did try to do my lines very lightly. I hope you can see them. Otherwise, uh, if you do really dark lines and you've got a really light subject, I often get the question, well, how do you remove the lines? Well, once they get wet, they become pretty permanent. So if you know something's going to be quite light, um, begin, uh, begin with light lines. Get them lightened up before you begin the painting pro process because getting them wet will kind of lock them in. All right, so I'm going carefully around these, these shape, these petals that are in front. And I'm going to start bringing in uh, some more color here. Now, I think that was a little bit wet. So you can see it. I don't have very much control there. So I blotted my brush to get more in control. And you can see that as I add in these darker shadows, um, I can start to define the petals in front. So in, in a sense, I'm negative painting here. I'm going to get this paint a little bit um, less diluted so that I can get a richer color. Okay, blot my brush. So I don't want too much paint in there, or too much moisture in there, I should say. All right, so I'm coming in here with some more dark. Not going to take it up as far. It'll it'll keep crawling up there anyway. Now I need to get that dark right into this little tuck that into this little corner here. So in order to get this dark, I'm going to take some of this pink over to the side. And um, I think I'm going to use some neutral tint to get this darker. Taking some of that, putting a little neutral tint into it. Again, I want to blot my brush so it's not too wet. And I can get a nice dark in there. And I'm looking at, you know, what shape is that? And it's kind of a, kind of a straight line, right? I need to get this darker for for sure, so I'm going to go a little bit more, just neutral tint, always blotting my brush. Come in here and get that extra dark. And every time I want more control, I blot my brush a little bit more. So even after you start painting, you can continue blotting your brush. I don't want to travel that color up too far, so I'm going to go back to my pink mixture that I'd made and put that in, in there as well. I do a lot of... Uh, blotting of my brush as I work, as you've probably noticed. But um, but I do think that that uh, can make a huge difference. All right, so I'm also going to blot my brush here. And I want to make sure that this line comes up and continues, looks, looks correct with that. So I'm going to lift up any of the any of this darker color that sort of started moving over into this area so I'm going to lift some of that up while I still can it's nice and um, 
nice and uh, damp still, so I can I can lift that without any problem. Just one thing to remember though is that if you are um, using a staining color, uh, let, let's say we were using something like a um, a phthalo color, uh, that will not lift as easily. So you're going to have to stay more within your within your uh, space. You cannot always lift it out like that. Um, even even when it's wet, it may leave a little bit of uh, a um, um, a stain on the paper. Okay, so there's a question. Is is it possible to buy the palette in Canada? I tried in the US, but they do not deliver to Germany. Uh, my only hope now is that Canada will ship to Germany. Uh, maybe someone can help me. Um, when I purchased mine, this one here, I, I purchased it from a place called Studio 6, but honestly, I don't think they carry it anymore. Um, uh, you can ask, uh, well, gosh, I don't know. I, I would check out some of the Canadian sources that I have listed on my webpage. And um, just usually they all have websites. So you should be able to um, determine whether or not they carry it. Um, or even, even a, um, send them an email or something like that. Uh, there is another similar palette uh, called um, the Stephen Quiller palette. Also is is configured very much the same. It, it is like a color wheel. I think it even has the same number of wells. Uh, the only difference is that it is a square. So there's these sort of these corners, you know, like this is framed here. It's got those corners. So it is a square palette with a round um, uh wells like this. So it's quite similar as well. All right. So I now have something dark. It's very tiny, but I have something dark in my painting. Um, it, it sort of feels right now like, oh my gosh, maybe that's too dark. It feels that way, but um, I'm going to let that dry. I may have to lighten it. I, I think I'm going to be okay though. And I don't mind exaggerating the contrast a little bit, but I'm going to move on to the next um, the next section here. So if I were to wet this petal right here, I'll just be careful right there. I don't want to move anything that's already wet that is hasn't quite dried. I don't want to get anything bleeding. So typically I'll, I'll kind of bounce around my whole painting and we'll work uh, somewhere that isn't next to an area that is drying. But since I already started wetting it, I'm committed. <laughs> so I'm going to come in here and get some of those darker tones in the shadow that area there. And you can clean up, you know, if you want to try to get this line right up to that, do it while this section is wet. Don't wait until it dries and then try to fix that. You'll want to do that before it, um, before it gets locked in and dried. Yeah, somebody told me um, that there was something similar, I think, in in the UK, but I, I couldn't tell you where. Maybe Jackson's. Um, by the way, if you have uh, suppliers or if you know, if you find that out, uh, toss me an, a note about it because I will add, you know, if, if anybody knows of great sources to buy materials and stuff, just uh, send, send me a note and I will uh, add it to my... Um, add it to my sources on my page. You know, it's there for everybody's use, not just my own. So a lot of people, you know, since COVID, everything's been a little bit harder to find. It's, there just seems to be, um, most of the stores are not carrying the same uh, level of inventory. 
they are carrying, it seems that they are carrying a little bit less than they used to. And, uh, and I guess that makes sense because many of them are shifting to online. They had to do that during the pandemic. So uh, you're not always going to be able to just go to your local store and, and pick your materials off the shelf the way we used to. Um, now I'm going to get some of this dark into this little little corner here, this little spot. And I have a brush with a pretty good point here. So that allows me to get this little point nice and clean. All right, so I've got those two shapes established. All right. And so in a sense, uh, I've completed those petals. Now I picked a, a this one's almost like, uh, it's not an opened up uh, rose because I knew that it would take us an awfully long time. If you pick something, uh, if you pick a flower that has uh, like a peony that has like a million and one petals, it, it does take time. If you're painting realistically, you have to imagine how much time it takes to paint them one petal at a time. And uh, something like a peony is very, uh, <laughs> uh, it has a lot of petals. So not all of the shadows are going to have this level of darkness. There's much softer ones down here. So I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work the larger petals. And the reason that I like to work the larger petals first is because they are like, um, they're like landmarks, you know, you, I mentioned this once before in, in one of my videos that, you know, if you're trying to get to a destination, you don't need to know every single street in order to get to where you're going to, as long as you find a landmark. So some of these bigger shapes act as landmarks. And once you get them anchored in and uh, painted, it makes it so much easier to sort out the, the little petals. If you're trying to do every petal one at a time and sort of build from one area and and, and work outward from there, um, it, it sometimes makes it more challenging to figure out where you are. But if you have some big big spaces uh, that are filled in, it can be a little, e at least for me, I find it a little easier to sort out. And I guess everybody has their own method of working. But this is a bigger area. I'm going to dampen this first. Um, for some of these smaller petals, I won't be I won't be wetting it first because they are so small. But now, right along this edge, I want to make sure that that's got a nice clean edge there. And I know that this has to get quite soft. And if it doesn't soften quite the way I want, rinse and blot my brush. And then I use my brush kind of on its side, not the point of my brush, but the side of my brush. Um, maybe I can show better with my other camera, um, with, with my brush sort of laying down on the surface. And, and I can carve that out. Now I do notice one thing about this, this particular part of the petal, and that is that, um, this here looks a little bit more golden. It's, it's ever so slight, but it looks a little bit more golden. So I'm going to put a little bit more raw sienna in that spot. All right, so I'm going to put a little more raw sienna, which is a little bit more golden, and I'm going to put that in this area right here. And the two can merge, they can merge together, those two colors, and I can get that nice sort of transition um, going on in there. Let's get a little bit more sort of pink tone in here. Might not have wet it quite enough. And if that happens to you and you, you realize, uh oh, I didn't wet it enough, uh, don't panic. You might just need to take a damp brush and help it move.
All right. I think that's dark enough. Okay. So I can I can't I can't work right next to this, but I can work in this little I can carve out this little shadow right here. And this one I didn't wet first because it's really not a very big space. Okay, so let me move back to my overhead and you can see the little space that I carved out of there. So I'm going to go along now and work some of these other areas. And every time I paint one petal, it defines the next one. So, so this one here, one of the first ones we did, I can now show the form of that petal by coming in and painting the shadow in for the one next to it. So I've just put in some color, but I didn't do it on wet. So I'm going to blot my brush run my brush along that that upper edge that's still wet and I can soften that edge. Let's put a little bit in there and that's going to get nice and soft. Um, Alright, so I'm just going to keep working around. This one kind of wraps around this this little section here, so dampen that. And then with a clean blotted brush, I can soften that edge. So when you get into some of those skinnier areas, you may have to um, just so like put it on dry and then soften as you go. Because if it's too skinny an area and you wet it, uh, it's very hard to um, to control how far that paint travels. So one of the next big ones I want to do is of course this really the bowl, the main bowl of the uh, the rose. And in this case this is where I see a little bit of the gold tone, a little bit of the pink tone, and a little bit of the blue tone. Now that may not jump out at you very obviously but you can, but if I point it out, then you can see it. And um, start hunting for color that um, may not be obvious. The one thing that sort of separates the amateurs from the people that are more experienced is their ability to um, visualize and identify subtle things. So, I'm going to I'm going to wet this because this is quite a large area. So I'm going to wet this first. I'm going to be very careful of the the fold over there. But this is going to make a this one big petal will make a big difference in everything. Everything that I've painted so far. I was going. I was actually contemplating going down to our local uh, Royal Botanical Gardens today, but I haven't tested out my. Uh, I have some equipment that I I bought. The so the challenge, of course, when you're plein air painting, and you're doing a live, is uh, who's filming? <laughs> I don't have a crew, so I have to um, I have to sort that out. Plus, if I'm not right where the camera is, I need to use a microphone. So. I have a stand. I have a microphone. So one of these uh, one of these weeks, I'm going to come along and uh, I'll be I'll be live at the gardens um, painting. So I'm coming in here and um, still wetting this area, but I'm taking taking my time, doing it with care. You know, I'm kind of a precise painter. Uh, some of you that might paint more loosely um, will be a little faster at this, and that's fine. That's your painting style. I don't think you should change it to be like me or to be like anybody else. I think you just need to um, realize that that's your painting personality, and uh, and, and I wouldn't fight it. Uh, sure, try different styles for sure. I mean, you don't even know what your personality is if you don't try something else. But uh, 
absolutely do um, follow your gut and if, if you don't have the patience to paint as precisely as I do, well, don't. That's not you. So I, I think there's nothing wrong with um, uh, painting different than somebody else. And I think it's better if we all paint differently. Life would be too boring if we were all painting the same. So I don't have too much in my brush here, but I want to get a little bit more pink on this one side. A little bit more of that blush. And it's nice and wet, so I'm getting a nice uh, sort of softening that's going on there. And as I come around, I'm going to take some of this permanent rose and a little bit of my cobalt blue. So it's going to get a little bit, little bit purple, but it's definitely going to cool it down by adding the blue. And here's where I'm going to come in, and I'm looking to see... All right, that starts right about here. I'm going to blot my brush so I have a little bit more um, control over where how far this spreads. And I'm going to come in, get a little more blue in here maybe, blot my brush. Come down. I see that there's a, a real sort of cast shadow here where it's coming down and um, giving us that that shading on that petal. And it blends into this bottom part here. And look how soft everything's getting. You know, it's still staying, staying nice and soft. And the secret to that is, is getting the paper damp to start with, like wetting it first. And that will um, really help with the softness. But I do have to keep in mind that things are going to um, dry a lot lighter. Now that to me was a little bit purple, so I'm going to add a little neutral tint to that. I don't want it to be too bright or too purple looking. So if I add a little, a little whisper of neutral tint to that, that takes the that punch out of that color. See, so you can see that there's an exaggeration there of what I have done to um, create that cool and warm. Now, depending on the kind of per painter you want to be, um, or painter you are, perhaps, uh, you know, you might you might feel that that's like too extreme. You don't want to do that. Well, don't. Don't do it if it's if it's not to your taste. I think it's very important to be true to who you are as a painter. Just because a painter, another painter does it one way does not mean that that's the only way or the right way or anything else. It just means it's a different way. So I'm going to come in a little, a little warmer there and get that in there. Blot my brush, soften it slightly. And all at once, I can create that petal. I'm going to put a little bit more pink, I think, over on this one side. But you know what? I can feel my papers beginning to, it's beginning to dry a little bit. So I'm going to have to wrap this petal up before it uh, starts to give me problems with the painting. All right, and I did get a little bit of a harder edge there. I'm going to come back to that just so I can show you how to uh, deal with that sort of thing. And that, that's partly because I came back in with more color and it pushed off to the side, you know, till it couldn't, couldn't flow anymore. And then it leaves a dark line. And it's not so hard to get rid of. I used to worry about that cr like crazy, but... Um, and it used to it used to make everything look like it had a dark outline if if I went into an area that was too wet and that sort of thing. But I can come in and I can soften that later. Um, if I softened it now, I'm risking blossoms and things like that. So I'm just going to go on to another petal. Um, 
All right, I want to work the next, I want to work another big petal, so I'm just going to dry this quickly. Especially this little spot here, because I want to work next to that. And this, this purple, doesn't it look so out of place right now? Very often, <laughs> including me, I would look at that and go, Oh, that doesn't look right at all. It's st standing out in it. Oh, that doesn't look right. And it's because it's isolated. You know, if you had a predominantly yellow painting and all of a sudden you, you splashed some red on it uh, in one spot, your eye is just going to go straight there. And that's always going to look like it's, you know, the odd man out, the thing that doesn't fit. But once you start incorporating it in other places, uh, it will be, it'll fit in just fine. So if I took some of that same sort of purple tone and I put it into this petal, this shadow right down in here, now it's not unusual at all. Right, now it fits. So as we work around, um, I'm still thinking about the warm and cool, um, but I have to keep in mind that as I'm painting, uh, when I first start a color that's new, it will feel out of place. Uh, yes, I do find that humidity does affect my approach. Uh, if, In fact, this weekend I was working on a painting um, during my, I, I had my booth and I was demonstrating. So at one point the sun came out and was cooking <laughs> basically my paper because I was actually in the sun and it was cooking my paper as I was trying to do a big smooth wash. So um, all of a sudden it was like drying it faster than I could paint it. Uh, I'll actually, I'm, I'm going to uh, um, show you what I mean. I'll show you the painting that I was demonstrating. I'll zoom out to show it to you just just to uh, kind of cover this topic. Uh, let me zoom out a bit because this is a bigger painting but um, so this is this is the wash that I was trying to do uh, and it was very patchy as I was working on it. So what I had to do when I got home was re-wet all of this and um, like really wet soften up the, the excess color because this is a very dark color I had to soften all of that up tip tip this so that the paint would would drip off down here and um, and then it smoothed smoothed that out but it actually had sort of shiny spots and you could see every brush mark but now it's as smooth as can be so um, I managed to uh, recover from that uh, patchiness, but that was caused because I had the sun on me and was drying faster than I could apply the paint, even though even though I was painting with uh, wet paint. So absolutely, humidity does uh, factor in. If I'm painting um, in uh, Arizona where it's really dry or something like that, um, now I've actually never been to Arizona, but I do know it's dry there, and. Um, yeah, you would have to work a little bit differently in order to um, to do that. Um, in that case, I had to just basically persevere, uh, knowing that I was going to get a lot of brush marks. And then um, when I could get into a climate control, like in my air conditioning, I was able to re-wet that and uh, smooth that out. Very often the solution to having a, a, a wash that doesn't look smooth is just to wet it again. It'll soften up the paint that's on the paper and it will often uh, resolve any issues. Now, of course, that all depends on how long the, how, you know, how long the paints had to been sitting on there dry. It also depends on whether it's a staining color and, and things like that. But for the most part, I find that um, the uh, just re-wetting an area will often help um, you know, like I could pro if I worked at this, I could probably manipulate some of that color. So when you re-wet something, you can redistribute first layers or previous layers. 
especially in in things that are dark that have um, gotten perhaps a bit patchy or a wash um, that didn't kind of end up the way you wanted it that sort of thing I often get that with people people saying well how do I, how am I going to fix this sky it's all patchy I usually just say wet it again wet it again and kind of move that paint around that's already there I mean you can soften it up just the same way you soften up your palette <clears throat> so there's a, there's actually quite a lot you can do more than you think you know you always hear that oh watercolor is so hard and it it's unforgiving and you know all these um, things it's only unforgiving if you don't know what to do about it um, if, if you've painted for a while you've chances are you've probably discovered some of these things that um, um, help to I mean you've been halfway through a painting you've invested a lot of time you you'll you'll get desperate and you'll try different things and, and I always kind of chuckle when somebody says to me that um, that uh, I, I never make mistakes and it's like oh my gosh of course I make mistakes or they'll they'll say something like uh, how did I learn how to make all or to fix all these mistakes and my answer of course is oh well, guess <laughs> I made all the mistakes so I'm coming in with some of this nice dark in here. This is a good dark little corner here. It's a little cranny down in here between the, you know, as it starts to go down into into the throat of the uh, the rose or the the deep areas of the rose. So I'm coming in with a little bit more of that neutral tint again because this is this is really dark and dull. So a little bit of that neutral tint is going to get this darker. And I really don't have too much in my brush. When I'm painting realistically, um, I will often just use a little bit in my brush. And if, if, if I run out of time, I will run out of time and I will just let it dry and I'll re-wet it and keep going. And just, I work in small increments. That is my style of painting. It's not everybody's, and I can fully appreciate that, and no, that's fine. So I'm just blending out some of this color here, coming in under there. I'm going to pull some of that back. Maybe that's more than I want. And... There we go. So I've got a little bit there. Um, and there's going to be small nuances that I'm, I'll put in. I'm not going to be able to like put in a big wash and get in every little detail on every single petal. That's just, um, it, it's not practical to think that way. So uh, I'm going to work over here now and I'm going to work on this big petal on the outside, upper left, because it is sort of almost like it's got a fold in it right so it's got this uh, dark side and then it's got a light side so I'm going to wet the whole thing not just part of it because it'll always look like it has a, a seam in the middle but um, but I want a soft transition so I want to make sure that I've got it dampened first and even if I'm not even if I'm not going to paint here I will paint there, but even if I weren't, I would still wet the entire petal because um, paint will travel a, a remarkable dis distance. And if it finds that hard edge, it will leave a mark. It'll leave that mark like we have on this petal right here. So you want to uh, you want to wet the whole thing. Sometimes somebody has something to fix in a sky. And they can't believe it when I say, well, you've got to wet the whole sky again. <laughs> and, and they're like, but but it's only this one little spot. Yes, but a patch always looks like a patch. So wet the whole thing, and then it will look like it's natural. Okay, so... Um, Dolores says, yes, Arizona is dry, 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 most of the time, except in the monsoon season. 
a real problem for watercolors. Yes, I have heard that from other friends that um, go there in the winter, that it can be uh, very challenging to paint in watercolor. All right, so I'm looking at this petal right here, and there's almost a divide line right there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start there. And I know that all of this is going to get a little bit uh, cooler as we come down. Maybe not quite as dark there, so I'll pull up. If I'm if I if I guess wrong or put something in the wrong place, I can pull up color. So that's what I'm doing, and. Um, and it's going to get a little bit more pink around the edges, just a little blush there. And then back to some of this cool at the bottom. So back to this um, sort of purple mixture. Right there. And then just, just before it hits here, I see this kind of golden color in there. Uh, I guess it's the light coming through that petal, or perhaps it's a petal, um, maybe it's a reflection off of this little thing here, which I didn't put in my drawing, by the way, but um, I'm going to put a little bit of gold color in there, that raw sienna. It seems like shouldn't be there to me, but it doesn't matter that what I'm seeing is telling me different. So unless my eyes are lying, that gold belongs in there. So there it goes. Now provided I don't take my brush in and now brush all of this around back and forth and back and forth, as long as I don't do that, I don't have mud. It's when you start, uh, like cause I've got blue, this has a, this purple color has some blue in it. Then I've got the red, uh, and then I've got the gold, and if I start mixing that together, I've got all my primaries, and you know that mixing all of those is going to make mud. So, don't want to do that. I know that has to be a little darker, but it's not blending quite as smoothly as I want. So I'm going to blot my brush. I know that my paper's drying, and that's why. So I'm just going to get a real blotted brush soften what I can and get out of there. Um, anything I do in here right now is risking a bunch of brush marks. And uh, mistakes, yes, Dolores, mistakes are the best teachers. <laughs> oh yeah, um, very true. All right, so we, we have something similar going on with this petal here in front, but because that one's still wet, I can't work on that. Um, I'm going to just dry this, because I'm running out of petals that I can work on. So I'll just uh, dry this and I'll be able to re-wet and continue. So this, this is that sort of slow build that I do sometimes. Uh, or if, if I find that, you know, oops, that dried too fast, you know, that was my Arizona petal, I guess, where it dried too fast. So I'm going to, I'm just feeling it with the, my finger to see if it's cooled down enough. And if, if I've dried that, those colors won't move. That's why it's so important to make sure, whether you're using a dryer, if you're letting it dry naturally, you've got to make sure... All your layers are dry between coats, uh, you know, between glazes and things like that. You've got to make sure or you will start moving around paint and you will not be happy. So let's come in here and I'm re-dampening this. Even down here, if I'm not going to add any more there, I'm still dampening the whole petal so I can come in and 
I'm going to take, I'm almost running out of this purple color, so I'm going to mix up a little bit more. And the purple color, uh, if I just mix blue and red, it's like, like crazy bright, bright purple. So I don't want that, clearly. So I'm going to put some neutral tint into that and take that punch out of that purple. Now you can you can shift either to more to a blue or more of a red purple. Um, you know, just go easy on um, like too much blue. It'll it'll like jump right at you. Uh, it's predominantly a pink uh, rose, so or pinkish rose. So you want to have a little probably a little bit more in the um, pink family because otherwise um, it's going to stand out and look quite out of place. And I still think that's too blue. Let's get a little bit more permanent rose back in there. And still too bright, so let's take a little bit See, so you can see the difference here. This was a blue rose or a blue uh, purple, and this is a pink purple. So if I go more, a little bit more of a pink purple, it'll still, uh, relatively speaking, it will still look um, cooler than other colors that I have on here. So as I said, you know, there's a lot of comparative stuff that happens in painting in watercolor. So comparatively speaking, this is cooler than than this pink, for example, which is a nice clean color. Too much, so just blend that in right away. And there's just a slight bit right along here as well. So I'm going to just blend that a little bit, want that a little bit softer. And I, I am getting, you know, a couple of couple of hard edges. And I, it used to distress me terribly to have that. But um, I'll show you here what I can do about that harsh line. So clean brush, blot it once again. I'm always blotting my brush. And I can come along and just dampen that, that edge to get a new paper towel, dry one, and blot. Dampen it and blot it. And you'll see that that edge does not have to stay there because if I dampen it, all I'm doing is I'm reactivating that layer and by blotting it I'm pulling off the excess. So it's going to really do a lot to soften up that harshness of that line. So it does help a lot uh, to sort of revisit some of these areas if they got a little bit dark or something like that and you can uh, just dampen it and blot that off and that becomes very soft. So that solved that problem. All right, I want to work on this petal but I'm going to have to wait for that one to dry so I'll work elsewhere. Um, I'm going to, I'll work maybe on some of these small petals right here. There's always some place you can work. Now these are small areas, so I'm just going to use some, some wet color in my brush. Instead of wetting it first, I'm using wet color. Just really getting up on the tiptoe of my brush so I can work carefully around those uh, little turnovers. Well, that needs to be, as I was talking about comparative comparative values, which is lighter, this triangle shape that I'm doing or the petal below? And I would say that the triangle shape is darker. So I need to come in a little darker here because comparative to this petal, this is this needs to be little darker. And that's what'll make it 
fit together properly. It's like putting the right puzzle pieces together when you're comparing all the values. Um, I'm going to do the same thing here and this one this one I see a little hint of that that golden tone in there is again and it's it's just sort of bouncing off of some of these petals here I think um, so I'm going to put some of that in I'm going to start off with some a wet brush of with some permanent rose in it that permanent rose mixture I should say and then I'm going to pick up a little bit of the raw sienna and continue that. So I get a little bit of golden tone. And honestly, this this is a um, this is a method that I used on one of my recent paintings of a rose. Um, it was a, a bigger painting, but um, I used this color temperature as my uh, means of creating form. So just the fact that that was changing color there gives you the feeling that that is uh, becoming um, closer to the light. The other thing that's going to determine that, of course, is the value. And to keep the, the golden area looking lighter than the, the uh, pinker area, I may have to lift a little bit of, I put the color in there, but if it's the same amount of color, or if it's the same sort of um, amount of uh, gold as we have the pink, then the, they're going to look the same, they're just going to change color. But I want to get a little bit more of the that um, sort of blushy pink color down in here, which is going to also be a little slightly darker, right? This golden area, by lifting out a little bit of color, allows more of that white paper to come through, uh, makes it, making it feel lighter. Uh, Rusty has a, no, um, yes, Rusty has a question. When is it best to use a color wash instead of a water wash? Oh, um, usually in smaller areas. Uh, so if I'm, you know, this is a small area. I, I didn't think that I, I needed to wet that first because I felt that I could manage putting in wet color rather than wetting it first. But a big petal like this, I wouldn't have attempted that because this this large bowl area here that I don't think I could have got it all done. Sometimes I wet an area first in order to uh, buy myself some time or to work in a large area. All right, so I'm going to continue on with um, a couple of, I'm getting into some of these smaller um, areas here, but I need to get some some pink pink tone in here. This, this needs to be a little bit darker right there. I'm gonna rinse my brush and soften this upper part. It's a very tiny area. I would never, uh, I certainly wouldn't wet this section first because I wouldn't have enough control. Um, I think I forgot to trace something there. Just draw it in. This comes down like that. Okay, so I want to put this in here. Use a damp brush to soften the top edge of that because it definitely, as it comes out and reaches out towards the light, of course it gets much lighter. And then the, you get some of these really small sections. I would definitely work on dry paper for those because they are so small. Uh, just get, get in, get your brush rinsed and blotted very quickly before that dries and it really will help um, if you make sure that you are putting in color that's wet enough like if, it, if I put this in and it was so dry that it was um, already set before I got my brush rinsed and blotted if that's already set I can't move it so make sure you're putting in color that's wet enough to move or to soften as you go 
So now I could yeah, I could even switch to it to my smallest brush here. This one's a number six here, number six brush, and um, I'm going to come in and uh, do this one in the middle. I'm going to do the centers I think of these. It's looking a little bit too pink. I'm going to put a little bit more of the raw sienna in it. Honestly, I do not mind if, you know, if I'm working from a photo reference, I don't mind if my colors are a little bit more lively than the photo reference. One thing I do find about um, photography is sometimes you lose um, you lose color, you lose, uh, and it increases contrast so much. So sometimes you need to almost scale back some of the contrast. But um, switching to a smaller brush here for these little, little tiny areas. Um, and, you know, sometimes these areas are so small that they're tricky to work in, but you have to use a smaller brush, but you still, even though it's a small area, you have to pay attention to where it's light and where it's dark, even if it's a really tiny area. So right down there in the, tucked in the, the point of those is, is getting quite a bit darker. I'm going to get a little neutral tint in here. All right, so it, it's coming along, but you know what's really going to make this um, look more polished is when we define the outer edges. Um, this, that's when you're really going to start to see more dimension in this. And I can, I can certainly see, I mean, I, even, I haven't even finished all the petals yet. I can certainly see that I could come in with more glazes. Like this one here, to me, looked, looked dark when I did it. But now that it's dry and compared to other things, I can see I can definitely get darker in that area. But it's it's some of this outer part uh, that is going to really kind of define this this uh, rose. So I'm going to come in. Uh, I'm kind of jumping around, but only, that's only because uh, we're an hour and a half in already, and uh, I think we should move along. But I'm going to um, come in with some neutral tint and mix that into my my green mixture here nice and wet nice and wet because I want to I want to control uh, sort of where this uh, goes and it's a big area that I want to work here so I don't want to define this rose too much so or the background too much so I just want to come in with some darker color In some of these areas and you'll see that you know this this currently is darker than the background but if I come in and uh, darken darken the background more I used Quinn gold with that right so I make a dark green and then even darker with neutral tint Right? But my brush is really wet, and I am going to work very quickly because I want to I want to soften some of this. Should be switching to my bigger brush, in fact. So I could come in here and now just with clean water, I can start to fade some of this away. no definition yet like I, I'm really not uh, trying to um, develop my background or anything like that I want to keep the background fairly uh, loose you know and so I can work really carefully on my center of interest and make that really in focus but then when I want to do my background I can get a lot looser so if I come in with some colors in here and start to uh, 
hint at some of the rose, roses, other roses that are in the picture, then I can uh, really start to define the, the main rose. You know, it's that whole negative painting thing again, right? So I'm just going to come around this and shape this petal. And it doesn't bother me at all that that green is still wet. I'm just going to let those two sort of melt together and give me a blurry background. I don't, I don't care that I have these little marks. Uh, those, those, as much as I'm a realistic painter, in a background, those are not a worry for me. Um, in fact, I think sometimes if we make things in the background more loose, um, you'll get less of, oh my gosh, goodness, that looks just like a photo, and a little bit more of, it looks like a painting. And so I don't mind seeing a little bit of, um, oh, what shall we call it? Uh, just looseness, I guess, in the background. So I can just sort of hint at this, uh, sh these shapes in here. I don't even have to really um, fine tune them, but I want to put some darks in here, especially, um, especially up against the rows here, right? So there's, I know that there's some darks in there, and I'm gonna mix a little neutral tint into that and really let that start to um, make this rose sort of illuminate. Uh, it's going to relatively speaking this is darker so it's going to make the the rose look lighter so I'll come in here with some darks into the, some of those areas and you can see I can make something really really soft and loose in the background let's come up into here we'll get some more darks in here definitely have to get a little bit more neutral tint into here now here's where I'm being careful up against the shape of the the actual rose that we're we're painting. And when you have something like this that um, where we're working a background, one of the reasons I softened this edge is so that we don't have like a start point and a, um, you know, and, and it looks like there's a seam right here where there's a hard line that formed. So I can actually kind of work around the entire painting with with these colors and, uh, and get this background in quite quickly, really. Um, so I'm going to come in here with some more color but it's going to get a little bit, a little bit duller. I'm put some blue, put some neutral tint in there, right? So we we get some more, a little bit more coolness in the background, especially up there in the corners where you don't really want to have too much attention in the corners of your painting. Just that kind of leads the eye out. So don't want to put a lot of um, a lot back there. looseness of, of the background just accentuates the the details in the in the actual rows so it could take me uh, quite a while really to develop this you know I, I like to take my time and that's my painting personality it, for some of you you might think well gosh forget that I'm not I'm not spending that much time working on it but I'm never in a hurry to finish my paintings I I actually <laughs> I love I love just painting, so if I have a brush in my hand, I'm happy. So I, I'm sometimes I almost feel a little sad when I'm getting to the end of a painting, um, but I'm always thinking about the next one. <laughs> my my favorite painting is always my latest painting. If you do, you feel that way yourselves. I don't know if I'm the only one who feels that way. <laughs> Let me know. Um, but I always feel like the one I'm working on is my favorite. In, in the moment until the next one and then that one's my favorite I'm gonna go a little lighter here so thin thinner color 
Um, but while this is wet, I can come in and just sort of allude to some detail, like I did on this one down here, just sort of make it suggested. And I want to make sure I'm, I'm changing up between uh, color temperatures, you know, sometimes a little more golden, sometimes a little bit more pink, or cool down a little bit more purple. Um, always switching it up keeping keeping things interesting and but not not highly defined the only thing that's defined is the edges of our main rows here and uh, I'm just going to come in and get a little bit more here and I'm going to keep this edge wet because that's where I'm going to continue painting but I want to get a little bit of suggested detail up in here and as you can see I'm not being too um, precise about it or anything like that just hinting some of that darker green up in the corner a little bit right there just hinting at stuff let's get a little bit more now that was starting to dry a little bit my brush was a little bit wetter so I got a little bit of looseness uh, or I got a little bit of um, a little bit more hard line there but I'm I'm moving on don't stop to fix anything Things are drying fast, so I'm going to just come in and start putting my darks up in this corner before I lose the opportunity. Even a bit of suggestion of pink back in there. Just hinting at this stuff. It's almost um, a little bit abstract, really, in here. Right, so you can see how abstract I'm making this background, uh, but got to keep moving. I am working on dry paper. I could have wet this first. That also would have been an option, uh, but the chances of me getting all the way around and it not um, starting to dry uh, would be pretty remote. So there's a little bit... You know, I paint so precisely all the time. This is this part's for me is a little bit a little bit scary. I do hold my breath. Um, but it's also kind of exhilarating because I have to work quickly and um, and I don't know exactly what's going to happen. That that part in itself is a little bit um, exhilarating, right? So if you're more of a sort of a thrill seeker in watercolor, <laughs> then uh, you, you'll probably enjoy this process. I'm going to go a little more golden down in here, maybe a little bit, a little bit lighter through here. There's something really light right here, so I'll just lift some of that out. And 
add a dark because that always makes something look lighter. So if you ever want to make something look lighter, throw a dark in there. Everything's comparative, just like I said. It's, you know, if you wanted to make something look lighter, add something darker. Simple solution, really. Alright, so that's a very simple um, simple background. I could leave it that way. I could. I could let it dry. I could come back in and I could, you know, make a more of a vignette. So if, if I wanted to re-wet all of this after it was dry, I could come in and, and maybe just sort of darken around the corners. I actually did that in the photograph, as you can see. But I could definitely come in and, and get some more things in there. I can use a little bit of negative painting to start to define things like the uh, bracts uh, for the petal or any of the leaves or some something like that. I could easily do that. So if I come in maybe with a little more neutral tint in my green or even just another layer of the green, that's that's enough to start to create shapes that I want in here. So if I come in and add a little bit of negative painting there, then I have to rinse and blot my brush and I will just blend that out. Right? And I can create more and more of that and and darken in areas if I want to. So let's say if I wanted a little bit darker up in here, I could come in and do that and just be careful with the background that you don't all of a sudden you're making it as detailed as your foreground or as your your main subject but this will add enough context to this rose to help the viewer understand what is going on you know that this rose isn't just one that's floating in space that it actually does have um, a little bit of um, uh, surrounded by f other roses and that it is uh, got um, a stem and everything else. So I could come in and uh, carve out some of these uh, negative areas. And uh, I've had people say, oh, I can't do negative painting. And I bet you're doing it without even knowing it. Um, you're just not thinking, oh, this is negative painting. But I just painted around the entire rose and that's negative painting. So I come in just when you're doing this stage of the game I would recommend that you make sure that that green color you're putting down is wet enough that you can grab a brush and soften that so that it disappears if you put it down too dry you're not going to be able to soften that so um, I would I would find a few select areas to allude to detail, not actually painted, but allude to it. So like here, for example, and soften that. Maybe in here, I would make that a little bit darker. And I'm going to just turn it because it's easier for me to work this way. So I would come in with maybe some, some neutral tint here. Let's get that a little wetter. Some neutral tint in here. rinse my brush, soften this edge. And you can see that every time I do something extra to this, that it starts to look more and more and more uh, developed. Um, I'm going to jump back into my rose here just for a minute so I can add in this detail here because this, this part looks a little odd without any uh, value changes or anything in there. It's just a flat color. So I'm going to come in and uh, do this petal here. I think I need cleaner water at this point, but we're okay. Up into there, that's good enough. And I want to come in with um, definitely some more cool color here. And that's going to go in 
get tucked right in there. Now my brush is pretty wet, so it's it's expanding, like it's kind of going out of where I want it. So I just blot my brush and pull that, like kind of pull it, rein it back and, and keep it under control. Do I prefer flat brushes for straight edges? Um, depends on what I'm doing. If I'm doing um, architecture, absolutely. Um, anything with really tight corners like that, I, I will often use a flat brush. Uh, but I, I find I use rounds more than anything. They're, they're my workhorse um, in my painting, I think, the, flat, the rounds. <clears throat> now this was really wet. I have to get this paint less runny because it's it, it's a little bit difficult for me to control when it's running so much. So I have to make sure that I'm getting my paint over here a little less runny and I'm also brought, blotting my brush. I'm going to put a little bit of neutral tint into that in t as well, I think. Blot it and get that in there. I'm really looking at this shape as I do this. Right? What shape is that shadow? And I'm going to come in with a little bit more of this purple. I think it's probably a little too pink, but Get that under under control there. Now I'm putting it on and I can feel, oh boy, the paper is already starting to dry. So this is where I come in, blot my brush, and really soften that as fast as I can so that that doesn't create problems for me. Uh, but I know that I don't want to work in here too much more because that's going to give me issues. I can feel it. It's, it's, and it is a kind of feel thing like right? you don't um, you don't always I can't just show you you have to feel it with your brush so I'm going to um, put a little more blue into this and while this is wet I'm going to come in with a little bit more here and there's a slightly light lighter area it's like a little bit of reflected light or something there and this, these are the kind of subtleties that I was saying that you, you want to start noticing um, to level up your watercolors. I think if you don't notice these things, then um, they get overlooked and it has a little bit more flatness to it. So if you're looking for more dimension in your watercolors, I think noticing the color temperature, the value changes, uh, those types of things can make a big difference. Uh, but you can see how this um, could easily be developed. I, I, I obviously can't spend all day working on this, but I would. <laughs> I mean, I, I would definitely spend all day working on this. And um, so you could build this up a little bit at a time. Don't overwork a background because that just draws the eye to the background. Uh, sometimes it can make something look really too busy and uh, it won't be as appealing. So uh, just keep your background more simplified, a little bit on the abstract side. You can put your details into your um, main subject and just build. So building layers just means things like coming in over top of something that has dried like this and you can um, add more layers you know if you need a darker value you can do it so I built I have a tendency to build in small increments and then um, uh, rather than going in bold but um, but that's because I'm a realistic painter if uh, if you like to paint more loosely I would try to achieve the um, the right value on the first pass because uh, you want to keep that that freshness <clears throat> Pardon me. As you come in with every layer, don't change things up. So I'm not going to start putting uh, a purpley color in here or a, a yellow color in here. 
after I've initially started with a red. Uh, I could end up with something really muddy if I start really changing up. If I made that into a purpley red, that could turn very muddy looking. So be careful that you're staying true to, like you're watching the placement of these things on your first layers and then build on that. Um, I wouldn't change things up too much. It's when you start, it, it, a lot of people will take their uh, first layers and say, oh, I don't think that was right. Go with whatever you did in the first place. Because <laughs> if you start changing things up, you really can, if, especially if you don't know much about um, color mixing, you could end up with something very muddy. And this is something that I hear a lot is, oh, my, every time, I'm no good at color mixing and it, my colors always to end up muddy. And it's, it goes back to what I was saying here, where if, if you stir together all of those primary colors, because I am using primarily um, cobalt blue, permanent rose, and raw sienna uh, for most of this. And if I start stirring all those primary colors together, it could get very muddy. So I have to be very careful about uh, being consistent with the placement of these things as I'm building up um, subsequent layers. Don't don't start changing the placement of things. Uh, that could that could give you a little bit of a headache. So I'm going to come in here with a little bit more raw sienna, maybe a little bit more the red to get this get this petal a little darker and you know I could I could eventually uh, build this up a lot darker and all of a sudden that petal looks like so dark but remember I would come in and I would adjust probably all or most of my other petals in order to get the right values but look at the luminosity of this area that I just did uh, and that is the key to um, you know, creating luminous watercolors. I put the colors in the same place. And if you ever want to check to see whether it's dark enough, because very often it's, it's easy to question whether or not it's dark enough. Uh, you can take a little square like this uh, with a little hole in the middle of it. I've shown this before. Uh, I can't do that because it's wet, but I could put it somewhere where it's dry. And uh, I could compare and say, okay, well, is that the right value? Um, and it looks like I'm pretty close there. Uh, but I would check other areas as well. That's kind of wet, so I can't really do it. But, you know, that's how you can compare whether or not you're in the right uh, value range. And after a while, you won't need these so much. You'll you'll get better at uh, judging those values. Uh, you notice I use permanent rose. What are my thoughts on uh, uh, Quinn Magenta and those other hot pink colors? Um, I like them. They're, they're very nice colors. I just didn't think that it I do use permanent rose a lot, and you'll find most uh, most artists will have their favorites. Uh, permanent rose is just the one that uh, that I've I've used a lot. It is a it is a transparent color, so it um, it's very versatile for creating transparency, um, and uh, it, it's nice pleasant pink. So I, I could use some of those other colors. Um, and I do. I, I do use some of those. I have I have other colors on my palette. I have I have this one called Opus, which is uh, almost a neon pink. I can show you. It's um, like it's it's almost like opera. It's very very bright. I use and this is my permanent rose compared to it. Um, you know, it's also it's also nice and bright. But sometimes you need like this almost. It's almost a fuchsia kind of color very very bright I have uh, this is my um, a permanent alizarin crimson and then I've got uh, what's this one this one's uh, quinacridone violet um, but I could have quin quinacridone magenta would also there's a whole range of reds that you can use and if I were doing a whole garden and I needed a lot of different colors I probably would use uh, many of those different varieties of pinks and reds uh, but in this case, it's very monochromatic. You know, all the roses are very similar in color. So um, I didn't really need a whole range. I, I typically will keep my palette very limited. 
Um, but um, anyway, uh, I, have, I have red lens glasses that help with finding the values. Yes, um, value, those the value glasses or a piece of red acetate takes the color out. Um, it will help you to, um, like once it removes the color, you can see whether or not the values are correct. And, you know, I can see certain things like this is way too light um, and that sort of thing. And, and although this color might be pretty good, this is probably too light by comparison. And in fact, I, I don't even think I have the shape right there. So, you know, I would come in and I would adjust a couple of things like that. There's definitely some darks that have to come into here and that sort of thing. So that's what I would do is I would take a lot of time and I would um, build those up. And I have these these darks in here and now a few in the, my background and that helps me to judge and um, that often happens in my painting is that I just the more darks I get in the more I have to go back to adjust things and so to paint realistically um, it can be very time consuming um, it, it isn't for the faint of heart I mean you do have to work at it and um, it can be uh, it can be quite interesting. Have I done a field of wildflowers? Not as a demonstration, but I can add that one to the list. And if you have any ideas of things that you would like to see in future demos, by all means, put it in the chat. Let me know, and uh, I will I will add it to the list. Whatever I get uh, requested most is uh, generally what I will work on. Or if you know, depending on maybe if I have a a proper reference image too that I can work from. Uh, would I do any more to bring the foreground and the background together? Um, you could, yes, you could. If you wanted to include uh, some of the background, bringing it into this foreground, for example, I could, uh, I could take some of this color uh, here, for example, and start bringing it down into here. So as I'm doing the background, if you wanted to bring some of that color down into here, by all means, uh, go for it. It wouldn't even be a bad idea to lose an edge once in a while, but um, but yeah, right here, for example, I could sort of get that background connected a little bit more to my to my rows. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, that was a, a good point. Another portrait, yes. Um, I'm actually working on another portrait right now. Uh, portraits sometimes take a very long time and, and very often what I will do is I will um, show elements of a portrait. For example, a mouth with teeth, a mouth uh, you know, from a different perspective or a nose or ears or hair or eyes and um, I, I would break it down into elements. Um, otherwise I'm doing a, an entire workshop on Wednesday mornings <laughs> rather than than a quick demo and uh, speaking of quick demos we are at the two hour mark I think we need to wrap this up so thank you so much for hanging in there for those of you that have been uh, <laughs> are still here thank you so much um, yeah you can you can keep adding your comments and um, um, if if the uh, live stream ends you can always add those comments under the comment section under the video and so if you like it if you like seeing this kind of content you know what to do you can subscribe you can hit the bell notification or anything like that and most of all share <laughs> let the word out so that'd be awesome um, I don't think I missed any questions uh, oh wait a minute oh no I got I think I got all the questions if I missed any, I apologize. I will uh, I will try to answer it under the comment section. So I'll wrap it up. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful week, and we will see you next time. Bye for now.